while re while re why is that so hard to say? <laughs> it shouldn't be. I'm staring right at it. This is this should not be this hard. <laughs> Here we go. While re <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. Travel back in time to the 80s. Reliving the advice. Carpe diem. Seize the day. The comebacks. Why don't you take a picture? It'll last longer. <laughs> and the technology. Are you telling me you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? Because just like you, we're stuck in the 80s. Can you say stuck in the 80s? Hey, hey, welcome to Stuck in the 80s. It's your host, Steve Spears. And Brad in LA. And today we talk to one of my favorite pop culture journalists. It's our interview with Whitney Matheson. Very handy, I can tell. I bet you like to read a lot, too. Print is dead. Steve, Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Podcast Network. You can find our podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and the CLNS Media Mobile app. And don't forget to listen to our podcast at the CLNS Media website. You can find it at clnsmedia.com. And as always, we plead, we beg, we grovel. Please, if you love our show, share the links on social media. And don't forget to like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Brad, today, I, and I'm not kidding, this is an interview I've been waiting a while to do. Uh, it's my podcast chat with Whitney Matheson. She's the former pop candy blogger at USA Today. We'll also have Seggy with some really fun letters about malls in the 80s to read. But first, I have to get real for a minute. Um, people who have followed the podcast for a long time know that normally at some point during one of the shows, I will refer to my loyal companion, Kat Benatar, my roommate. Um, she, will, she will try to sneak onto the podcasting table, rub her face on the microphone, Climb all over the keyboard. Yep. She hasn't been feeling well. I mean, she she's had diabetes for a long time, and I've you know been taking care of her. She's 18 years old. But last week, I had to to make the decision to put her down. If you've been following me on Facebook, you you know this news, but it's it's sad nonetheless. I mean, she's been a part of the podcast for. I mean, close to 10 years, but she wasn't eating anymore. She couldn't really stand. And mm, that's awful. Yeah. It's been, I'm sorry, Steve. It's been awful. It really, uh, I, I took the day off from work when it happened. You know, it, I, I don't, it's just not easy. It's it's never going to be easy when, you know, you have a pet that's that kind of companion. I've never had to put down a pet before. You know, like Nick Rhodes was my previous cat, mm -hmm. and he, I mean, not that this is any better, but he died in my arms. Like, he had, like, a little heart attack and, like, oh, gosh. squealed in pain and sucked his last breaths while he, I was holding him in my arms. And that was traumatic wow. enough. But like, yeah, seriously. But Well, yeah, but you're not, like, making a decision like, yeah. I need you to do this. Right. To this this animal that I love that loves me. This is a cat that yeah. like never turned down a meal. Like she would eat like every single time. Like the second I put the the dish down, if I didn't get my hands out in time, like they were like <laughs> an option. <laughs> so when she didn't eat for three days, that was uh anyway, she's gone. I think everybody out there who left a really nice message on Facebook, it you know, really meant a lot to me and uh uh you know, I'm not going to have another pet for a while, that's for sure. I, you know, my girlfriend has a dog, and that's my focus right now, pet-wise. There'll be no Catrick Swayze. There'll be no Steve Purry for a while. Oh, I like Steve Purry. Yeah. But rest in peace, Cat Benatar. <laughs> Today's podcast is sponsored by Bombas. Hey, when I was in school, the cool thing was uh, navy blue corduroy pants, a comb in the back pocket, an Ario Speedwagon concert jersey. 
Heck, I'd still rock that today if I could find the blue cords that fit me. Uh, I'd feel as cool as I did when I was 14, but nowadays it's Bomba socks that bring out all the envy on the schoolyard or at the workplace. It's really not surprising why they're the most comfortable socks ever. And they're colorful, literally bursting with color. The ones I have on now have a pattern I can't even quite describe, but I love them, even though they're aimed more for kids than for adults. So send your kids back to school with socks that keep them comfy, colorful, and ready to take on the school year. And since Bombas donates a pair of socks for every pair purchased, you should get some for yourself too. I wear Bombas to the office every day, and my feet just feel better. I can even catch my coworkers checking them out when they think I'm not looking. Let's face it, I'm not a fashion model, but my socks make me feel like one. Visit bombas.com slash 80s and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash 80S for uh, 20% off your first purchase. Bombas.com slash 80s. Your feet will thank you and your kids will even thank you. We're back. And I want everyone to get ready for this amazing chat I had with Whitney Matheson. She was one of the inspirations behind the original Stuck in the 80s blog starting in 1999. Whitney was a blogger for USA Today. And for about 15 years, she wrote a blog called Pop Candy, which was um, really the first thing I read every morning before I thought about what I was going to write that day for Stuck in the 80s. She always had the scoop on what 80s movies was going to be remade. Uh, what bands that you and I loved, Brad, had a new album coming out. Hmm. Which TV shows had special stars from the 80s on the next episode. I basically took all my marching orders from her uh, blog posts. Her blog even won the same award as my blog. Uh, I think it was either a year earlier or later after I won mine. It's the Epi Award for Best Entertainment Blog. It's sitting 10 feet away from me as we speak. Lovely. Sadly, she was laid off by USA Today. In 2014, like as newspapers were kind of doing their little reorganization dance, as I like to call it. Um, yeah. Yeah. A sad dance, not a rain dance. It never did rain. But during our chat, she'll tell us what she's been up to since then and tell us about a new book project she's been working on that was released this spring. Obviously, you know, jumped at the chance to have her on the show. She's so much fun. She totally gets, by the way, our love of the 80s cruise. We talked about that a lot. In fact, I think we were still talking about it when we got started with the podcast. So, like, if you're a little bit disoriented when the podcast begins, just know that we're, like, (laughs) we're totally into the 80s cruise at that point. (laughs) She shares our love, Brad, of Cameron Crowe, R.E.M., everything 80s. So, without further ado, here's my chat with one of my favorite writers, Whitney Matheson. Yeah, I wanted to know, have you done the 80s cruise yet or do you do it? Because it sounds like my my dream event <laughs> to go on. And I've never been on a cruise, but this is like the one. Cruise. Yeah. Um, actually, there's been one for the last four years. So the one that's coming up will be the fifth year in a row. They, they do it every spring. And okay. it's always in the Caribbean. Oh, man. So you, should, you really, really should come. It's um, every year. So you, have, you always have the original MTV VJs are always there. Re- like which, which VJs? Like... Nina Blackwood, Nina, there. Mark, and Alan, because uh, Mar- oh. Martha doesn't travel very much, so she's not on it. Okay. But the rest of them are, and on top of that, you usually have. I think this year there's 16 bands, and so every day is just nothing but Q and A's, meet and greets, concerts, or you'll have like a wine tasting with Terry Nunn from Berlin. Or <laughs> oh Mickey God. Thomas from Starship will do a, um, a kitchen demonstration for vegan cooking or something like that. Um, and then my co-host and I, we do we host all the trivia sessions. And then we'll okay. record live podcasts. And then so last year we did, or this year I guess it was, was our 500th show. And so we had Martha, not Martha, we had um, Alan... Uh, Nina and Alan all on stage and we interviewed them all at once before a live audience. Oh man, I've got, I really do. Okay. I want to come. What's like the best band you've seen on, on the cruise? You know, it changes every year. You, someone comes on there and you're like, Oh, they're never going to top that performance. But this year, Sheila E was actually just blew everybody <gasps> away. Oh, I bet. Oh man. But, but okay. other years. Yeah. Right. 
Spring 2020. Spring 2020. I'll send you the link. It's amazing. <laughs> it really is. I know a lot of people who okay. have never been on cruises go on this cruise and it, you know, it changes their minds about cruising. So, <laughs> okay, cool. and you can hang with us. Yeah. You can be our guest for trivia. Please, I'll, oh, I will. I will dominate <laughs> if I play. I, I will play to win. <laughs> We've had we've had modern English be up there with us and answer questions. It's fun. It's always a blast. Uh. <laughs> speaking of speaking of blast, it's just kind of cool finally having you on the podcast. I mean, I have I have cribbed your blog for for writing ideas for for over a decade, and so it's nice to finally have a one on one chat. Yes, this is so great. I can't believe it. Why did it take so long? How is it taking so long? <laughs> Because this is like, yeah, this is ideal. This is a, a dream podcast for me to be on. Yeah. I mean, for, for years, I, I mean, I, I would at 8 o'clock every morning, I would go to usatoday.com and look at Pop Candy. And I'd go and look for all the – at least a third of the items would be have some sort of 80s angle. And I'd be like, okay, yep. there's a blog item for today. There's a blog item for today. <laughs> there's a blog <laughs> item for today. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad that was some, provided some early morning inspiration. Let, let me ask you this though, like you, you did it for fifteen years, right? Yes, which is crazy. Nobody does anything for fifteen years anymore. Right. Well, stuck in eighties is just starting its fifteenth year. Okay. Um, okay. Well, only but, only one other place. <laughs> no, no. But this is the po- the podcast that is the blog that I used to write called Stuck in the Eighties. It lasted fourteen years, and then the newspaper pulled the plug on it. But yeah, toward. Towards the end of my run, I found it was getting harder and harder each day to, to to come up with a new story or report something new that was based in the eighties. I'm just kind of curious. Did you sort of have the same experience with Pop Candy? Well, I mean, I was lucky in that. I mean, you definitely have like a that's a strong niche. But you know, I expanded it, so I was covering like not only so, like you know um, retro kind of stuff, but also brand new stuff. I covered, you know, music and film and a lot of comic books. And so I had such a broad kind of place to look. I was mainly just, you know, looking for things that actually weren't getting too much coverage other places. Um, that I don't know if that was like such a struggle coming up with idea. Generally I had like more ideas than I really could actually execute, but, um, the hardest part, I think, toward the end, especially, was just like keeping up with that crazy pace, you know, of just cranking out stuff, um, you know, sometimes like 10 things a day. That that got to be a lot. And of course, like that sort of pressure for ev- everybody, but everywhere kind of increased as as people, you know, Twitter killed the blog, as they say. Yeah, yeah. I always, my problem has always been when I try to do like an interview with somebody and they find out the name of the podcast is stuck in the eighties. They, they sometimes get kind of snippy about that. Oh yeah. Cause they, they think that I'm saying that they're stuck in the eighties and I'm like, no, yeah. no, no, I'm stuck in the eighties. <laughs> and I've, I've had people turn me down for interviews. Like Brian Adams famously turned me down for an interview because according to, as his publicist said, if anything, he's stuck in the nineties, which I just thought was ridiculous. <laughs> Well, plus they probably like, you know, you, it's not like you're just asking about the eight, you know, like they, they might right. think, oh, this is just a quest. Like he's only going to ask about this thing, whatever. Yeah. I, yeah. I've gotten stuff like that too, but see once, but once they talk to you, they realize that they were wrong. <laughs> yeah. But to this day though, I still kind of say, oh, I just do a blog. I do a podcast about pop culture and I don't yeah. say the name and I just let it go with that. And you know, you know, let let the chips fall where they may. Um, yeah. So w- when you left when you left USA Today, uh, if I'm reading right, like you 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 went back to to, to Tennessee and you you taught for a while, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, I was in because I I was at USA Today. I worked at, in many cities. I was in D.C. for a while doing pop candy, and then I was in Chicago, and then I was in New York uh, for a long most of the time. And so yeah, then after that ended i i had a baby so i had like a one and a half year old and i talked to like other publication and i i just really had to sit and think a minute about what i wanted to do and and um i mainly i I don't i just couldn't go do the same gig at another place and sit in another cubicle and so i i moved to tennessee and uh 
you know, was able to have a great job down there at a university. I was a journalist in residence and um, I was able to teach and I helped a lot of student journalists get published. And that's what I did for about three years. And I had more time to spend with my daughter, which is what I really wanted to. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm just curious because you, you and I probably went to journalism, journalism school about the same time. I mean, for me, it was the late 80s. Um, yeah. But for me, it was, I, yeah, it was like mid 90s for me. So. Right. Okay. But I, I'd, I'd like to think that probably both those eras back then, I mean, I know I didn't see the changes coming to the business. Like, you know, I mean, I don't think anyone was talking about online stuff in the mid 80s. But and we certainly didn't see the, the changes that the industry would go through. I, I'm just kind of curious, like the journalism students today, did, did they did they realize what you know they're entering a field that where the future is kind of murky at best? <laughs> um, I mean, definitely because if nothing else, their parents tell them that you know, like there are a lot of <laughs> yeah. journalism students whose parents are like, "Wait, what are you doing?" You know, uh, and, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of exciting things about it that they really like. And the fact that it just looks a lot different than when we went to journalism school, you know, because they're learning, we're teaching them how to do podcasts and how to shoot and edit video. And, you know, of course, also, most of the bulk of what I taught was was writing. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, it's a little bit, I think for them, it's a little bit daunting, but it's also kind of exciting because there are just a lot of different things they can do. And quite Honestly, because I was teaching at the time of the election, and I noticed that I think after the election, it kind of has sparked more young people to want to get into journalism. Um, because there, you know, there have been some, I feel like, you know, they think that, okay, maybe this is a field where I can make a difference. Well, that's good. That's reassuring. I mean, yeah, one one hopes. But I, I mean, I, I don't know. I've noticed that. But then, of course, and I was also near Nashville. So I taught a lot of like the courses I taught. I taught like a pop culture reporting class and the, you know, music journalism class. And I had a lot of, you know, people who wanted to cover entertainment, too, which was super fun. That brings up an interesting question. What, for the longest time when I was doing Stuck in the 80s and I was doing it for the St. Pete Times, um, I, I did the Stuck in the 80s gig and I also did a lot of just general entertainment and pop culture reporting what but there are some things there are some parts of it that just to me were like so distasteful <laughs> it's just like you had to go home <laughs> at the end of the night and take like two showers um <laughs> I, 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 I i like as i as i think back i think back to like the Lindsay lohan trials and um i i guess maybe all the all the american idol type stuff and having to follow that every week and, and write updates about yes. you know who got bounced i mean what what were the moments for you when you were writing that you're like oh god i can't believe i have to write this stuff oh my gosh well luckily i pretty quickly started my own thing and established my own thing partly because of that because nothing kills my soul more than like gossip and like just empty kind of stuff like that um, that said, yes, I, well, I've only been to Florida actually two times in my life. Once was to cover American idols live many years ago, <laughs> and like, I remember that. which was like the touring, you know, like American idol, all star, whatever. And, I remember it. You know, I remember being there and I was like, oh, what am I doing here? What is my life? Um, so yeah. And then. I remember when Friends was ending, whenever that was. I mean, the amount of stuff I wrote about Friends, I was like, this is out of control. Like, do people, are people really, and people were into it. I was like, I can't, I can't look at this show again. I can't write about this show again. Too much. So yeah, there were a few things like that, for sure. But I really tried to like, you know, if something, if I was interested in something, like I would just grab onto it. And luckily I was working with some people who didn't mind covering a lot of that mainstream stuff. Um, but you know, if like, for instance, like doc, there's a new doctor who, or so everybody knew like, okay, that's, I'm super into that. And they could give that to me. I don't think I really got into doctor who until I watched the crown. And then I realized the actor who plays Prince Philip was one of the previous doctors. Yeah. I haven't even seen the crown yet. Cause there's what? too much TV. 
I I know. I know. There are a few shows like that I haven't I still haven't gotten to because there's just there's too much. But one day I will. Is it I yeah. guess it's worth it. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. But I I I didn't even it's it's so weird, like the history of, of my attachment to nostalgia usually beca- is because I see something new that reminds me of something old. In this case it was I can't remember what's what's his what's the name of the actor who plays Pins Philip and he was previously one of the doctors. I, oh, Matt I can't Smith. remember. Yeah, Matt Smith. Matt Smith. He was fantastic. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, where's this guy been? And people were telling me, he, he was the doctor forever. And I'm like, holy crap. So I went back and started watching all the episodes with him. And then I totally got into it again. It's 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 the same way a lot of times when I see, oh man, like you'll watch an episode of some TV show and they're using retro, like the Goldbergs or something like that. And they'll have they'll talk about poltergeist or something and you're like, Oh my God, I haven't seen poltergeist in 30 years. And you go back and watch it again. And it still scares the crap out of you as much as it did when you were 12 years old. You know, I had a moment like that. Do you watch the show better things with Pamela Adlon? Do you know no. the FX show? No. Uh, uh-uh. So, and do you know who, cause so she's, she was a child actor. She was in, uh, God, was she on facts of life? She was definitely in like say anything when she was, she was in tons of stuff when she was younger. Um, uh-huh. but that show, she often has guest stars who are from long ago. So she had, oh, what's his last name? His first name's Bernie. He was on the love boat. He was the doctor on the love boat. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And anyway, he was on like an episode, like there, there are tons of people on that show or I'm like, wait a minute. I have not seen that person in 30 years. There was the person, someone from like different strokes. Uh, she was like the Mrs. Garrett after Mrs. Garrett left. She was on there. And, you know, it's also people you haven't even thought about or didn't even realize they were still around. But, yeah, I love I love it when that happens. I have this theory that, like, nostalgia kind of goes in waves. I mean, when, we were, when I was a kid, there was a huge nostalgia for the 50s. And so you had shows like Happy Days and you had American Graffiti and Grease was big. And uh, the Stray Cats obviously had their rockabilly sound. And so the 50s had their, their – and, and a lot of the – great 80s classics like um a christmas story were, were based in earlier times and now here we are like 30 35 years later and now we have this huge nostalgia for 80s stuff and you so you see these actors getting their their second or their third wins and it just I, i'm curious what your thought is about um what is it that has made this 80s nostalgia revolutions seemingly so much stronger than previous ones. Is it, is it because there are so many more entertainment options? Is it because that period of time is sort of like one of the most, I don't know, last innocent times that we had? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you, you talk about like stranger things all the time. <laughs> Cause that's like the super extreme example of nostalgia. Uh, but yeah, that could be, because there were, yeah, there were so there's so many more things that we can be nostalgic about. There's so much more music and like from the 80s and TV and movies. But all, I mean, also it's like all the people making stuff now are, I mean, more a lot of people making stuff now grew up in that time, right? You know, so it's like, and I guess there's there's a lot of 90s nostalgia now too. Um, so that might be part of it too. Like those, those writers and those filmmakers are all kind of pulling from their own childhood. I don't know. And I just, yeah, I think a lot of it's just really good and evokes a really strong mood. Like for when it comes around where people are like nostalgic for the early two thousands, I'm not sure what that's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you mentioned nostalgia for the nineties and it, that kind of rings true to me now because we just had the, I think the mixtape tour just ended the one that had um, Tiffany and Debbie Gibson and was it new kids on the block? Were they the ones who were headlining it? I forget, but it was one of those bands that was more, it felt more nineties than eighties. And I started to think, Oh God, are we about to enter the nineties the nostalgia period? Cause I'm not sure I could handle listening to the spin doctors every day on the radio. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I feel like, uh, well, yeah, I think people are already nostalgic for the 90s, right? Or at least I th- it goes by age. Like if you, people like uh, a little bit younger than me, for sure, are much more, and I guess I'm kind of in between, um, 
I'm nostalgic for the 80s and the 90s. But yeah, and then when I taught, you know, my students, they're nostalgic for stuff that only happened like 10 years ago. So Oh, no. What could they possibly <laughs> be nostalgic for that happened 10 years ago? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's all depends on depends upon like how how old the person is but i i feel like, like some podcasts i listen to and the hosts are a little bit younger than me i notice they're super nostalgic about like things i can't even like you know nickelodeon shows like 90s stuff that i just can't really relate to because i was a little bit older yeah i've actually kind of gone the opposite direction these days i've started becoming more nostalgic for the late 70s again and so on the podcast we've done a couple shows about um songs that reach number two but no, but no farther on the charts from the late 70s and so we're you know all this beautiful music that was you know soft fm back in the day like when i guess when when you were really young and i was too too young to drive and so you were subjected to whatever music your parents wanted to listen to so oh yes which was like barry manilow for me and the carpenters and uh yeah i was subject to a lot that, I, that might not have been my first i mean all that stuff i kind of i don't mind now if i hear it but oh man so much well also like 70s tv are you do you, are you nostalgic for like 70s tv at all i was talking about mod with somebody the other day if it's if it's on if if something comes on like the mary tyler moore show or something like that and it's a a great episode or something like yeah i'll, I'll watch it i mean there's there's this nice innocent and almost predictable quality to it you know that I still enjoy. Yeah. Maud, though, that's that's hardcore. That's an intense show. Yeah, every <laughs> yeah. week. New new intense issue, issue addressed every week. I get Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I could get more, I could get nostalgic about like 70s TV too because it was all in syndication. So I still, you know, I grew up, I, I watched Good Times and all these shows that really first aired before my time, but it was still on the air when I was a kid. Yeah. Well, all that stuff from... The late sixties and early seventies. I mean, you you got it every day when you went home. You listened. To, you watched Gilligan's Island. You watched the Monkees. You know, yeah, you, the Flintstones. You know, all that kind of stuff. And, and people today are just. I remember sitting at a pool one time, and there was a, a bunch of adults and a bunch of little kids, and we were doing sing alongs to songs. And the kids did. We were doing Gilligan's Island, and the kids were like, "I don't know what you're singing." We're like, "It's Gilligan's Island." <laughs> it's like, how could you not know <laughs> the theme song to Gilligan's Island? And they're just like, "No, nope, we're sorry." And see, now there aren't any theme songs to anything. Well, I mean, right. uh, very few things. I was going to say, like, I, I guess, or or if there are theme songs, they're like pop songs, you know? They're not songs specifically written for the show. Right. Those days are probably long gone. It's a bummer. So these days you have a you have a pop culture hotline. Um, and I, I, see, I see it <laughs> yeah. every week on your on your e-news. You send out an e-news every Friday, and I love it. And it, it kind of gives me, like, my crib sheet for the weekend, like, what to check out, what videos to listen to, and like who's released new music. But um, you have the pop culture hotline, and people call in and they share what turns them on these days, entertainment wise. I'm just kind of curious have you gotten anything submitted that was so truly shocking and maybe not safe for print? Oh, oh, let me think. I mean, luckily, people are pretty cool. So, yeah, I was actually, well, this might be kind of an 80s throwback. So, yeah, I started, I have a phone number and you can call in every day. Well, I try every day, every other day. Sometimes I record a new goofy outgoing message, which is usually me being like, this is something I watched last night, what I, whatever I'm into at the moment. Or sometimes I just sing a song. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, people leave me voicemails. And often they'll tell me, you know, what band they're into or, you know, whatever, whatever they're watching or listening to. But yeah, sometimes people... Um, I don't know, tell jokes or tell me a funny story. People generally aren't like shocking on there or mean or anything. You know, it's usually just really goofy. And the whole thing was kind of inspired by Dial a Song. Do you know what that was? Like, they oh, might by, be giants. They might be giants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They had like, and they, I think they still have it. In fact, you used to be able to call this number and it was hooked up to an answering machine and you would hear like a a new they might be giant song on dial a song or maybe it was like a new version of a song you knew and that was just so cool to me so that's partly why i decided to do it there, there's supposed to be one now called call a notes where you call and you get to hear a hollow notes song every time 
Oh, I haven't tried that one. Okay. I'll, I'll, send, you, I'll send you the number. <laughs> <laughs> like, like we haven't heard enough Hall & Oates lately. They, those guys tour like they were 21 years old now. I mean, it's very impressive. I think, does Oates live in Nashville maybe? I think Oates has a Nashville connection. I don't remember. I believe he does. We, I interviewed him one time and like the obvious question about, you know, what's up with the mustache? At least we saved it till last. You know, as a, <laughs> why are people so obsessed with your mustache or, or lack of a mustache? And his whole answer, his answer was just, I don't know. <laughs> Over the years, you must've had some amazing interviews. Which ones still stand out? Which are your favorite to tell stories about? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I tell, I feel like I tell this. I've told it to so many people, but one of my all time favorites was actually what, not my best interview by any means, but, um, I'm a, massive Paul Rubens, Pee Wee Herman fan. I have lots of Pee Wee stuff. I, it's just like maybe my favorite TV show of all time. Definitely one of my favorite performers of all time. Um, and so one year, not uh, maybe 10 years ago, he was going to be at Comic-Con and I requested, I got an email or I don't know if I requested, could I talk to Paul? It was set up. Oh my gosh, I'm going to talk to Paul Rubens. This is like my dream. <laughs> and I was so excited. And the whole time, the you know, the publicist, like, we, we've been talking about where I'm going to meet Paul and whatever. Referring to, of course, because his name is Paul, it's not Pee Wee. I get to the place where we're going to have the interview. And it's a restaurant and it's been kind of shut down. There's nobody coming in. And then all of a sudden, Paul Rubens walks in, but he's dressed as. Pee Wee Herman, which is <laughs> not anything I expected. I just, I don't know. Like my heart just flew out. Like I, I didn't even know like how to react. Like, what do you do? So that was one of the most fun, like unexpected interviews he was wearing. He told me, I was like, is there anything you're wearing? That was like the, you know, an original piece of Pee Wee, the Pee Wee wardrobe. And he, and he pointed to the bow tie. It's like, yeah, this. And it's like, oh my God, he's wearing the original Pee Wee bow tie. So we did not have the best interview because I was so distracted. It was not what I had prepared for. I thought, whatever. But he, and it was also interesting because he was dressed as Pee Wee, but he was talking as Paul. Like I, I was, you know, so that was kind of like very disorienting. But that, that was one of my favorite interviews for sure. Um, and now I'm just blanking because they all pale in comparison. Uh, yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> but that was a good one. Yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm trying to think. You should throw out some names, and I'll tell you if I've I've talked to them. But that that's a that was a great memory for sure. I, I always find that comedians are the hardest to interview. So, like, what comedians come to mind that you that you interviewed over the years? Oh man, I mean, tons of yeah, that is true. They are very hard to interview, but you just have to go into, or at least I have to go into conversations with comedians remembering that they're not there to entertain me, you know, we're there to right. have a conversation. Exactly. Um, and, you know, of course, some of the most serious people you talk to are, can be comedians. But I think one of my favorites was I, I had written... I guess I should tell this. Yeah, I had written this piece about um, Jerry Seinfeld and like what I'm also a huge Seinfeld fan. Uh, like Stein, I wrote this thing about how I did this whole series on pop culture that helps us get through tough times. And for me, I went through a really hard time. Seinfeld got helped get me through it. So wrote it up. People seemed to dig it. And then not long after that, I got an email from either Jerry Seinfeld's like publicist or manager or someone who was like, Jerry read your piece and really was moved by it and really liked it. And that I, I, I just never expect anybody to read what I write, but that kind of blew me away. And then shortly after that, um, he, we did an interview, he, and which he actually requested or, you know, um, so we had, it was. It was good and also very weird because he, he had read that thing. But he and it's cool to know, like he, he kind of keeps up and and reads and sees stuff if people write nice things at least about him. Yeah. So that was he was a really cool person for sure. I 
I had the same issue happen with two different musicians. Um, Adam Ant and Steve Perry had both written, had both read something that I had written about them <gasps> and offered me an interview. And so I had interviews with both of them. And it was weird because they both kind of quoted something I wrote back to me. And I'm like, well, this is the most surreal thing that's ever going to happen in my life. Oh my gosh. I love Adam Ant. I love Adam Ant. That's what he is on my list, I think, of people I just dream of talking to how tell me about that how was that how was he to talk to he was great he this was right after he lived in tennessee for several years um after i forget i don't know if it was after a divorce or before ow my cat just bit me <laughs> oh no oh no not an out man your cat um no um <laughs> but he, i i had reviewed one of his shows in orlando and he he read it. Some of his publicists had passed it on to him, and and so he offered me the first interview of his next U.S. tour. And I think I was on the phone with him for about an hour, and it was just surreal because he I didn't realize he had spent all this time in Tennessee, like during some of his downtime, under like an assumed I didn't name. Know that. Oh, yeah, and somewhere in Middle Tennessee, I don't I can't remember exactly. It's been about six or seven years since I did that interview. But he was just real humble and talked about how his neighbors didn't know who he was, but he just kind of, you know, just member of the community, you know, helped people, lent them tools, you know, did whatever people do in Tennessee and, <laughs> um, and just in, and wrote a lot of songs about it that end up on his, uh, that on his, uh, the Gunner's Daughter album and stuff like that. But really just, I mean, I never thought, you know, the people you think you'll interview someday that you just, I mean, Adam Ant, no way. Oh man! Uh, you should get yeah, him. He's, you should. You be. He's on my you list. Should get him. I do. <laughs> I. I, sh I should. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to have him on the '80s cruise sometime. I know he's been talked about for that, so you never know. Oh man! Uh, we won't be able to keep you off that one. So I, I know that you are in a recently published book uh, called "Moving Forward: Real Introductions to Totally Made Up Books," to which you contributed. Um, you you wrote. <laughs> An introduction to um, to the Kool Aid Man. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a book. Uh, yeah, so the editor of that book, John Chapman, is uh, a cool guy who also stepped in and and would like blog for me. I think he even blogged for me while I was on my maternity leave. Um, so he he writes about pop culture sometimes, and yeah, he just he approached me and said he was working on this book full of made up forwards to imaginary books and asked me to do it and i mean some of the people who contribute to that book it's like the late adam west is in there and like shirley yeah. hansen and moby and it's like yeah i don't know why you're asking me i don't i but this is amazing and i'm thrilled to be part of like this cool group of people but yeah and then he said i could write about you know i could do anything i wanted and so yeah then i came up with Okay, well, what if the Kool Aid Man wrote a memoir, and now that's that's the essay that I wrote. <laughs> Kool Aid Kool Aid must have really made an impact on you when you were a kid. I mean, I guess so, and I guess Kool Aid is still around, but I have not. I ha and I can in my head I can taste that taste, but yeah, I guess it's still around. I don't know. My I don't think my kid has ever had Kool Aid. Would he even know what that is? No, I, I I remember having copious amounts of it when I was a kid, to the point where I remember <laughs> stealing, like from the cabinet, like the you know the mix, and thinking I'll just yes. drink the mix because it'll be good <gasps> on its own. And it's not; it's horrible. It's it's nearly poisonous. <laughs> it's, oh my god! You have gosh. to add all the sugar. Yes, you know? although and you so, could also get the mix that are didn't didn't they make? You could also get the kind that already included all the sugar. You could, which, but I guarantee you, my mom was, did not. Oh. <laughs> Which I think they even put more sugar in those. Not good. Not, it's amazing. Yeah. How did we even thinking about all of that stuff and like all the high C I drank and like <laughs> all of like the crazy food I ate? It's amazing that we made it yeah. out. If we had a dollar for every bologna sandwich we had as a kid, we'd be we wouldn't have to work in journalism anymore. Oh yeah, or fried bologna. That was oh, big too. That was the thing. <laughs> we had these things here called bologna boats. Uh, have you ever heard of a bologna boat? No. Okay. Please People tell hate me. when I talk I about bet. this on the podcast. Oh. So a bologna boat was was real popular in, in middle school cafeteria. You would take a slice of bologna, 
you take a scoop of mashed potatoes and put it on top and then you put a piece of American cheese on top of that and then you stick it in the oven and when you do the sides of the bologna curl up so it looks like a bologna boat <laughs> that's horrifying yeah but I still cra- I still I still have dreams about it oh. I bet oh, there's, there's a photo of it on my Facebook page it's it's like my uh, it's my cover photo is a bologna boat so okay I've got I'm gonna May- look so I'm curious though so you write the the um, fake introduction uh, or not, or the made-up introduction. Let's not call it fake. To uh, the Kool Aid Man, on the day in history when 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 we are given the the Whitney Matheson a memoir, who would be your dream person to write that introduction? Oh wow, an introduction to my memoir. I mean, oh, that's this is a great question. I wish I was able to prepare. I mean, of course, my first thought is. Can Paul Rubens do it or can Pee Wee Herman do it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it could be um, anybody, alive or dead, even. Oh, they could even be dead. Holy yes. ma- uh Well, who else? I mean, <sighs> Tim Burton? I don't know. Uh, I got I to gotta think some more on that. Oh, oh Jane Weedland, maybe I don't know. Maybe oh, that's a good pick. And, yeah, I don't know. They're, By yeah, far the coolest go go. Yeah. Oh, oh, totally. But I mean, they're all yeah. cool. But yeah, I love her. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I don't know. So so many, and my mind is being flooded. But yeah, Cameron Crow, maybe. Oh, oh, that you're stealing mine. That would be mine. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough question, but I yeah. like it. I'd, lo- I'd love to write the, the introduction to his memoir. Um, so what do you have coming up then for uh, the rest of the year or next year? Any other big projects, any books in the works? Well, I also did a children's book, which is all about how comic books are made. Um, I write a lot about comics. And so that is out on this platform that's like kind of like the Netflix of children's books, which is called Epic. So like get epic.com. Um, and for that, I talked to like tons of people who make amazing comics for children and they, they go through like all the jobs and how, how comic books are put together. So that's cool. That's called we make comics. I did that. Um, I have another book that I'm hoping will, well, I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I have another, it's a, it's in the stage where I hope that it, you know, somebody picks it up, but I think it's a good, it's going to be good if and when it gets out into the world. And then I freelance for a few different places. And then I also, I got on Patreon. So if people want to like, they can, they can go there to my Patreon page to subscribe to the newsletter. Also to, if they want to contribute and get some cool rewards. Um, yeah, I don't know. Those are a few of, of the things I have. There are many things, but those are the big ones, I guess. There's always one question that um, we we like to to banter around on the podcast. It's it's um, it's this idea that if we had a podcast time machine, and we could go back in time and fix or fix something we did wrong, or tell a younger version of ourselves one piece of advice that could possibly change their life for the better, what would it be? So I, so if I offered you a seat on the um, stuck in the '80s podcast time machine. What would you go back and tell, either tell a younger version of you about, or what thing would you go back and change that, or, or even just go back and witness if that's where you, you chose to use it? Oh, oh, go back and witness like something I could have never, oh, like a you band could I could have never seen or something. I if mean, that's how, if that's, if that's how you choose to use it, you could use it however oh, you want. Man. Okay. Well, one thing that comes to mind is I wish I could have seen rem in the early 80s so if i had a time machine i would love to go just to athens early 80s club show rem and or b52s honestly anybody that would be a dream um and then another just as a just a practical piece of advice 
I really should go back to like my 14, 15 year old self and say, please wear earplugs <laughs> all the time. Please, <laughs> please wear it. protect those ears. Cause so many shows, I've been to so many shows. And when I was younger, just, you know, next to the speaker and I'm suffering, wear earplugs and wear comfortable shoes. Because today I have you know, I have great stories to tell, but terrible hearing and terrible feet. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. If, I don't know if we can end things any better than that. Um, oh. <laughs> thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I I love. I loved it. There we go, Whitney Matheson. Really fun, right, Brad? Oh yeah. I, can Can I interview her next time? I yeah. want to talk to her. <laughs> She's so great. My favorite part, I, I, like, she kept surprising me, like, okay, talking about Cameron Crowe and all this kind of stuff. But when we got to the time capsule question, you know, the podcast time machine. Yep. What would you think of her answer? It's so practical. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, it's just a very pragmatic answer. So pragmatic. It is. I loved it. Um, you know, the only thing that would be more pragmatic than that was, you know, when you're 12 years old, you should probably start putting away some money in a 401k. <laughs> yeah. 10% every year. <laughs> like, yeah, I get it. It's not going to happen. I understand it. I do it now. Yeah. but uh, Well, little... sure, now, yeah, it's because we're old. <laughs> right. Like, we could die any day. So, who knows? If we don't die any day now, you know what we'll have to do? The, the Seggies. Steve, those are the tuneful stylings of one of my favorite seggies, reader mailbag or listener email box or whatever we were calling it these days. <laughs> so we got a couple letters this week, Steve, both in response to our recent interview with Michael Galinsky, the photographer behind those cool photo books of 1989 mall culture. The first one is from listener Tom Canine. I don't know if that means Tom is a dog or if Tom really likes dogs or if Tom's a canine <laughs> officer. I'm not sure. I, I can only speculate on the nickname. It's a fair question. But that's not what we're here to talk about today, Steve. We're here to talk about the 80s. So let me read Tom's letter. He begins, Hi, Stephen Brad. The mall talk really took me back. I used to hang out in the malls as a lot of us did, and I even worked at several. I worked in the Fallbrook Mall, Topanga Plaza, and the Northridge Mall. I'm sure Brad is aware of at least one of these as they're in the L.A. area. Fact check true. I've been to all three of those. Nice. So he continues. I worked at the now long gone Kenny's Shoes. Uh. It was a pretty good job, except that we had to wear a suit and tie. Once my car broke down and I had to skateboard to work. Not fun in a suit. <laughs> 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 It gets better. To make matters worse, the mall ninjas got on me about skating in the mall parking lot, saying it was not allowed. It took a while for them to understand I was going to work and not having fun. I guess a lot of suit and tie clad teenagers were shredding in the parking lot that week. <laughs> <laughs> Stop hassling me. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. One gag we played on New Guys was to send them to another shoe store in the mall to get a wall stretcher so he could fit more shoes in the back shelves. Of course, we'd call ahead and have them sent to yet another shoe store, and so on and so on. Once we made the poor newbie go to another mall to pick one up after he'd exhausted all the stores in our mall. <laughs> he almost quit when he found out there was no such thing. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. <coughs> we'll so, pause for Steve to regain his consciousness. It's so classic. That's so funny. Okay, he continues. From time to time, we would get women who wanted shoes that were way too small. They would be adamant that they were a six and a half, when in fact it was closer to an eight. No matter what we told them, they would argue with us that we were wrong and their size was smaller than it was in reality. In those cases, I would go in the back, switch the boxes, sharpie out the real size inside the shoes, and tell them to try this six and a half on. It would magically fit, and they would buy them none the wiser. The customer is always right. <laughs> I could go on and on with crazy mall stories, but this will have to suffice for now. Take care, you guys. Tom K9 in Northwest Washington. Wow. What a great story. Oh, uh, I, I love the skateboarding in the suit. Like, I don't think I've ever seen that. I've seen a lot of crazy shit in my life, but I've never seen that. I've can, I can picture it, though. That going to a store and like, can I get a wall stretcher? 
<laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, we just sent it over to pay less. Oh, thanks, man. Jeez. <laughs> oh, what a sucker. But so great. Cruel and unusual. So great. Letter number two today, Steve, we're spoiling you with these extra letters, is from Pensacola Jim. Jim writes, fellas, excellent call having Michael Galinsky on the show this week. It definitely stirred up many nostalgic memories of circling University Mall on weekend nights, hoping to catch the eye of the fairer sex, grossly overpaying for clothes at Chess King, or spending countless hours in Spaceport trying to obtain the high score on Donkey Kong. But most of all, it reminded me about spending time with my friends without a care in the world. If only we knew then how short that time would be. As always, thank you for another trip down memory lane that never fails to bring a smile to my face. And that is why I look forward to listening to this show each week. Wow. Still stuck in the 80s, Pensacola Jim. Oh, Jim. Getting teary. It's funny. When people ask me, you know, what, if you could have something back from the 80s, what would it be? My first answer, my like, gut reaction is the free time. Can I have the free time? Was there that much? I mean, just hanging out with your friends? It seems like it. We had like this informal poll going the other day on Facebook between all the people that we sometimes we that we normally hang out with on the 80s cruise and we were all talking about your interview with the mall guy and we were all saying, you know, who here had is there anyone here who didn't have a job at a mall? And Brad was one of the people who's never had a job at a mall. How weird is that? I just worked at crappy movie theaters that were not at malls. Well, it works out because like a movie theater is just as good as working in a mall. You're kind to say so, Steve. If you have things to tell us, if you've got letters you want to write us, things you want to get off your chest, podcast time machine stories you want to tell, email us, gentle listener, at podcast at sit80s.com. Did you hear that, Steve? That's Sting telling us it's time for I Want My Mystery TV, Mystery TV, MTV segment. I can't do it either. I don't, that, that segment yeah, now is you unintroducible. See the you see the problem now, right? <laughs> There's no way to introduce <laughs> that, Seggy. This is a segment where we play a short snippet of the theme song from a TV show that was on television in the 80s. And if you can identify it, you write in and tell us. We put your name in the bucket, spin the wheel. And if you're a lucky winner, you get the chance at either a bottle opener or a concert t-shirt that was given to listener Chase Squires by none other than MTV VJ Alan Hunter. Pay attention. Here's the clip from last time. Yes, that's Tales from the Crypt. Steve, we got a fair few right answers, but we also had some near misses. We had people that knew it was Danny Elfman, but guessed like movie themes or just kind of didn't quite hit the mark there. But that is a classic Danny Elfman composition. Totally, yeah. Uh, and it barely squeaks in. It, I think um, Tales from the Crypt came in like in the fall of 1989. So, and it was cable. So, if you want to like quibble with us, you know, I will hear your arguments. You will be overruled. But I will hear your arguments. If you'd like a refund for the podcast, <laughs> you just you send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and I will double your money back. There's a form you have to fill out. <laughs> and yeah. you, and you already ate. And most, I will kick 100% of your ass. And you already did eat most of the breakfast. So I'm just saying. Usually the podcast here is pretty good. But <laughs> this egg was a little undercooked. <laughs> uh, I guess it's my turn to read the winners, right, this time? Steve, why don't you read the winners? Oh, God, this is hard. Winners this week include Brock in North Dakota, Chris Joy, Dave in Oxford, Mark Ram, Alan Titus, Dallas Fitzgerald. That's a great name, by the way. Dean, who knew Brad when he was first bitten by the British sports car. It says bug, but I'm going to change it to plug. <laughs> Anfield Albert and Carlos M. Hernandez in St. Louis, Missouri. I get to spin the wheel this week, right? Because I'm yeah. like the- Steve, why don't you spin the wheel? We'll see who the winner is. <laughs> <laughs> Let me put my drink down. Put your truss on. <laughs> Holy crap. I didn't think they could go that fast. Oh, it hurts.
Okay. Oh, it's finally slowing down. Steve. Yep. Looks like it's going to be Carlos M. Hernandez in St. Louis, Missouri. Carlos, send us your mailing address and we will get either the bottle opener or the concert t-shirt out to you directly. In the meantime, here's this week's mystery clip. If you know it, email us at podcast at sit80s.com and tune in in a few weeks to find out if you're a winner. Hey, that's all the time we had this week. I'd like to thank Whitney Matheson again for coming on the show. Definitely going to take her up on her offer. I don't know if we recorded the offer or not, but she would love to come back and do some co-hosting. Nice. She would be so welcome. She's so smart, so funny. Really love her work. The books she contributed to, Moving Forward, Real Introductions to Totally Made Up Books is available wherever you do buy your print books. You can also contribute to her Patreon projects at WhitneyMatheson.com and follow her on Twitter at Whitney Matheson. In the meantime, I'd like to dedicate the closing credits to my dear friend Kat Benatar. She definitely had her stray cat going when I fell in love with her and I know she's someplace really fun, dry, and thunderstorm-free doing a little cat dance for all of us while we remain here hopelessly stuck in the 80s Stuck in the 80s is a member of the CLNS Media Network special thanks to Check Battery Daily for our theme music and don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes Stitcher or the CLNS Media mobile app